Okay, my name is Dan Walsh. I lead the container team at Red Hat. We're going to be talking about new container technologies. Marlon Patel is on my team, and he's... Yeah, so I'm a maintainer of the Run-C project, uh, which is a runtime that powers uh, Docker and most other high-level runtimes. And I'm also the lead developer of Cryo that we'll be talking about today. So let's get started. So uh, this is the, uh, for those that don't know, I tend to write coloring books. So that's like my key skill in the world. Um, so we actually, uh, this is unveiling of the new coloring book. Sadly, I didn't get the 400 I'm supposed to. I have a pile here. So after the talk, you guys can all kill each other to get these coloring books. Or you can go downstairs and there should be more down there. So um, anyways, uh, next generation container technology tools. So I'm going to talk a little bit. Um, for those who uh, saw my talk last year at the Red Hat Summit, I, I talked about PDFs. So wh what does containers have to do with about PDFs? So you see these three letters, PDF, what does it mean? If I see a file on the internet that has PDF after, what do you know about it? Anybody? Portable? No. What, what does it mean? It means I can view it. It means I can print it. Right? Or what does my wife see? When she sees a PDF, she knows she can view it and she can print it. Okay? How can she view and print it? In the web browser, using standard tools on the operating system, file browsers, mailers, Everybody can, anybody can view it. How do you create it? Just about any tool on a Linux operating system can create PDFs. Do you have to think about Adobe when that? Do you have to use Acrobat to do PDFs? Do you have to use Acro Read to re view PDFs? Would PDF have been so popular if everybody in the world always had to say Acrobat or Adobe? Most people in the room or most people outside of this room have no idea PDF is, was created by Adobe. Now we look at Linux. We look at Linux on the system. Linux, what does it mean? It runs everywhere. It runs on your cell phone, runs your cars. It runs, you know, basically the entire internet now runs on it. The entire cloud, everything runs Linux. Wouldn't it have been better if it was all Red Hat Linux? For me, it would have been a lot better. Okay, but even Red Hat wouldn't have been as successful if Linux had not taken off. So when you say Linux, you don't have to prefix it with some company's name. So the goal going forward is we have these things called containers. So we've got to start talking about containers as containers. Containers are, the, are basically processes that run on a Linux operating system. They're just processes. Container runtimes basically go out and configure different parts of the Linux kernel to run a process on the system. They're just regular processes running on the system. So I as we evolve the, the environment, we have to be able to build new tools and new ways of building these container technologies. Anybody know what a swear jar is? You have a swear jar in your house growing up? All right. In the US, I think pretty much everybody knows what a swear jar. So one of the problems we have when we talk about containers, you have to always say the D word. So going forward, anytime I say the D word, I gotta put some money into the swear jar. Okay? So we're gonna try to do this talk as much as possible without saying Docker. Okay? So a couple of months ago, this happened. This was huge. Okay, Red Hat and CoreOS got together. We merged together, and actually, I've been doing this talk for actually since uh, the springtime, and I was doing this talk in, in England, and that day, CoreOS and Red Hat merged. But back at KubeCon this past uh, uh, down in Austin, I actually went to a this before Red Hat. And, and CoreOS merged, and there was a talk I went to by an evangelist for CoreOS, and they got up there and they talked about all the different things that CoreOS had, had affected in the environment. And, and after I saw that talk, it, it really planted a seed in me, and when, after we merged with them, I had this talk, and I said, you know, I'm going to, during my talk, I'm going to point out where things that CoreOS did caused us to be able to build these new technologies. So the first one is, what do you need to run a container? All right, first of all, we have to identify what a container is or a container image. So a container image is basically, you know, the, this fancy container image is a tabball. So first of all, you get a root of fetch. You, you create a directory on the, on the system, and you make it look like Flash in a Linux operating system. That's a red, what we call a root of fetch. So I have a root of fetch, and then I tire it up. And then I have to create a, a JSON file that describes what the application inside of that little tabball is going to be. 
Okay, and that JSON basically describes, it describes things like environmental variables that I want to run. It describes what the entry point is, what the executable. So when I go and run the application, it just goes in and knows to run that application. So that's what a, a, uh, a, uh, a container image is. Um, and matter of fact, this is what the one thing that really Docker really set the world on fire uh, by doing is they created a standard way of getting these container images. They created the, the container image that everybody went out to, you know, um, Docker I.O. and, you know, were able to pull those down. And then eventually everybody started taking these images and they started creating distributions around the environment. Um, and so now there's Quay, uh, there is, you know, there's a container registries and whether it was an atomic registry or an OpenShift registry, there's Google has a registry. Everybody in the world has a registry now, right? So you can get these, these images from all over the place. But it wasn't standardized. So what CoreOS did is they said, we want to standardize this. We want to have a standardized container image that would run with Rocket. So they went out and they said, we're going to create a standard. And they called it AppC. And all of a sudden, the biggest fear in my life when I started working on containers was about to happen. If we go back 25 years ago, when RPM was invented, half of the Linux community said, we're going to do RPMs, and the other half said, we're going to do Debian format. So this meant that anybody who ever had a package of software from Linux distribution had to do it in two different formats, right? So all of a sudden, th that was happening in containers. So CoreOS put up a spec and said, try to get people to convince it, and all of a sudden, what, what, what that triggered was the OCI movement, Open Container Initiative. Because we realized that we didn't want to have two ways of doing these images, doing these, these creating these container images. Um, and all of a sudden, OCI was formed. It had Red Hat. It had Docker, the company. I don't have to pay for that one. Uh, it had um, CoreOS was involved. It had Microsoft, IBM, Google. Anybody else? Basically, those companies. And they came together and said, you know, we're going to standardize on the format. And they used the, form, the original format, and the OCI bundle format happened. So basically now I can define what it means to be a container image. So I have a container image, and it's called the OCI image bundle format. These bundles can be stored in any one of these container registries. What is a container registry? A container registry is nothing more than a web service, and there's some protocol defined for pulling images back and forth from container registries. So the first thing I need to do is I've identified what an application is. So when I want to run an application, I, have, I know what an application is. The next thing I need is I need to get it off of that container registry to my host. I need to be able to pull that image to my host. Uh, anybody in the room, tell me how you get an image from a registry to a host? You got a quarter? So you can do a deep pull, right? We're five years in. The only way to do a transaction with a web service to pull a tarball off of a web service to your host is deep pull. Isn't that sad? Five years into the container revolution. So we decided to create, uh, originally, we're going to talk about it later, we created a tool called Scopio. So we opened up a pull request to Docker, and uh, we uh, basically, these container images can get really, really huge. If you pull down a JBoss you know, application from RHEL, from the RHEL registry, it can be like 1.5 gigabytes. It is huge. Okay, and the only way you can basically, you want to look at that JSON file that's associated with the image, is you have to pull down that 1.5 gigabytes to your machine, and then all of a sudden you look at the JSON, ah, that's really not what I wanted, now you get rid of it. So we actually opened up, we wanted to open up a pull request with uh, upstream to basically change the um, Docker CLI to uh, basically do a inspect dash dash remote. So it basically said, all we want to do is pull down the, the little JSON file. We'll look at that. If I want it, then I'll pull down the big image. They said, no, we're not interested in that because we didn't want to make the interface more complex than it already is. So they said to us, it's just a web interface. Write your own code to do that. So we said we did, and we created this thing called Scopio. Over time, Scopio, the, guy, the engineer on my team that, who wrote Scopio, s sort of evolved it to the point where um, it was able to pull and push images. He said, well, I can pull down the JSON. Why don't I just built right to pull the image. Well, I pull the image, I can push the image. So you basically slowly built out the entire capability of pulling, pushing an image. And we'll talk about Scopy at the end. But we were working with CoreOS about a year ago, and CoreOS said, you know, we're interested in some of this technology that you have in Scopio. 
Um, but we really want to do it at a library level, not at the command line level. So they, they said, why don't you create this thing called container's image, or a thing that eventually became container's image. So it's a library for pulling these OCI image bundles back and forth. And it's only, it's basically involved, but it's evolved as its individual products. Now we're getting contributors from people who aren't doing anything with containers, all right? Pivotal, for instance, is a major contributor to container's image to, to plug into their garden. So it's a separate pro package and it's, um, it's, it's grown quite a bit. So after I pull down the image to the host, I need to explode it onto disk, right? I want to take that tarball, I want to untire it. So actually there's a layers of tarballs. So you have a, you know, the base image and then I put a layer on it and a layer is just another tarball that's a difference between the original and, and that, another JSON and then the JSON and you fill up these layers. Well these layers have to be stored on certain type of file system. They're called uh, container store, uh, basically a copy on write file system. So these are like uh, um, overlay file system, device mapper, ButterFS, uh, AUFS, there's a whole bunch of these have been developed over time. So what we decided to do here is to pull out a library um, out of the original Docker package and uh, basically build a standalone library that people could then, you know, put storage in. So now we have a copy on write file system called con GitHub Container Storage. And the last thing you need to do is to actually run the container. Okay, so running a container, what does it mean to run a container? Well, what it means during that OCI effort, they basically defined what it meant to run a container. So it was called the OCI runtime spec. So about a year ago, the OCI runtime spec was finalized, 1.0. And they defined what it meant to run a container. So after I pull down an image and I explode it on disk, it ends up being a root of fest. So now I need basically a definition to a program to say how do I run an application. And guess what? It's JSON. So what happens when you enter into all those command lines, uh, you know, all those options, it actually, you know, uh, you use the docker run command, for instance, and you, um, you know, add all those options. It's taking those options and it's putting them into a JSON file. It actually takes the uh, JSON file out of the image and it combines it to that JSON file and creates a JSON file that basically describes these are the environmental variables I'm going to use, the entry point, the, you know, different things like that, so maybe the C groups that I want to associate with it, um, any type of controls I want to put on it, and that's defined in a JSON script. Then an executable is executed. And that executable reads the JSON script and then uses the rootFS to run the application. That's called OCI image, uh, runtime spec. There is a default implementation of that, which Runnel is a maintainer of, a thing called Run C. So Run C is an executable that is executed under the runtimes of it. So all this stuff that I just described is all the things you need to run a container inside of your host. Did I mention anything about a daemon? So if I want to do all those things right now, I always have to have a big fat daemon. So if you follow me on Twitter at all, all I'm all, always hammering away is I don't want any more big fat daemons. All right, we keep on getting these big fat daemons. So I want to be able to implement all that stuff I just talked about without having to always go through one point of failure. So I work for OpenShift now. Traditionally worked for RHEL, but I now work for OpenShift. And this is our character in the comic book of the OpenShift guy. And he's really, really fast because he's able to distribute containers and orchestrate it. And OpenShift is really a, uh, is Red Hat's enterprise level Kubernetes plus plus. That's the way I like to think about it. So we implement the way Red, if you want to get Kubernetes from Red Hat, you buy OpenShift. And then we add additional features to OpenShift like development process and CI, CD, things like that. But basically OpenShift is our Kubernetes uh, uh, implementation. I work for OpenShift, but I work at the lowest level of OpenShift, so my boss is OpenShift slash Kubernetes. So what happens when OpenShift the Kubernetes needs to run a container? Well, CoreOS came in involved in this, and so if you went back and looked at the original version of Kubernetes, and you looked at the code, guess what was all over the code of Kubernetes? Docker CLI, okay, not Docker CLI, Docker Engine. I'm only put one quarter in there because it's just, <laughs> I'm running out of quarters. So there was a, you know, so Kubernetes had all this implementation that was t totally tied to that, and CoreOS came along and said, hey, what about us? We love Kubernetes, we want to work with Kubernetes, but we have this tool called Rocket. 
And so what they did is they built a huge patch set, a colossal patch set that basically said, if then else, if rocket do it this way, else do it this way. And all of a sudden, the, the upstream developers of, of Kubernetes said, time out. We can't be clouding up our code with all of these different container runtimes underneath it to be able to do it. And they said, we're going to turn it on its ear, and we're going to create a container runtime interface. And if your daemon implements this container runtime interface, we will call into you. But you're not going to dictate the way we call into you. We're going to call this interface, and you have to implement the interface. So CoreOS was the thing that triggered that. And that thing became CRI, Container Runtime Interface. So Kubernetes, you basically tell Kubernetes or OpenShift you want to run a container. Kubernetes tells the CRI to run a container image. The CRI needs to pull from the container registry, needs to store the image on copy and write file system, needs to execute an OCI runtime. Everybody follow? Seeing any symmetry with the last series of slides? So, we had invented all this stuff, and then I, I have these really brilliant engineers that work underneath me. And this guy came along and said, we don't need to do anything special. We could implement this thing simply using the tools we have. So he decided to go out and build this thing called Cryo. So the CRI stands for Container Runtime Interface for Kubernetes, and the O, we often say, stands for OCI Images, so OCI, or Open Containers. And this is our, in our coloring book, this is our implementation of what cryo is, and she's a surfboarder, I mean a snowboarder, because cry, cryogenic, get it? So cryo is an OCI-based implementation of the Kubernetes runtime, scope tied to Kubernetes CRI. It only supports Kubernetes. The only thing we support is Kubernetes. Now, I'm anti-big fat demons. I like to think of this as a nice, slim, tight demon, okay? It uses standard components as building blocks, Nothing more, nothing less. Cryo loves Kubernetes. Okay? So she is a one-woman man. A one-man woman. One woman, however you say it. Mesosphere? Not for cryo. Swarm? Saving a quarter. Not for cryo. Moby? Hell no. Never. Cryo loves Kubernetes, okay? The way we do it, every single patch that comes into Kubernetes, every single patch that comes into Kubernetes, I mean, into Cryo, has to patch the, pass the entire test suite. Right now, if you open up a PR for Cryo, we have nine test suites that we run. It takes several, no, well, it takes basically each one of these test suites takes about an hour, and you have to pass everyone. We will not merge anything that will ever break Kubernetes. That's our goal. Okay, so if you pull, you have to get it through, through us. So Ronald now is going to talk a little bit deeper about what cryo is. So Dan went over the standard components required for a container runtime. And that includes uh, run C, the containers image library, and the container storage library. So Cryo uses all these components. And besides that, it uses some other components as well. Uh, the first of them is the OCI runtime tools library. So we talked about how run C needs a JSON file, which has all the settings for like specifying the arguments, environment, capabilities, basically all the knobs that we need to tweak in the Linux kernel to create a container. Uh, so we started this uh, helper project called uh, Runtime Tools under OCI, and it has a generate library. Ba basically, it supports uh, all the settings that you would need to create that JSON file. So Cryo uses that, uses that standard library, and it is in sync with the OCI spec and Run C. So second, so we, like networking, when we looked at networking, networking is like a tangential problem to solve in the container space. And the best way we thought was we let it up to the networking experts to figure out how to do networking. And CoreOS had started this project called CNI. Uh, and CNI allows people, the networking experts in the industry, to create di different uh, plugins. So Cisco has a plugin, Weave has a plugin, CoreOS created Flannel, and like Red Hat worked on OpenShift SDN. So we decided to go with CNI. And basically, any plugin that is CNI compatible just works with Cryo. 
you, you use standard CNI configuration files to configure it. Uh, last but not the least, uh, there's a component called Conmon. It is like a mini, a mini daemon, which is used for monitoring, monitoring the container process. Like the way RunC works is there's a separate create and a start phase, and you need a mini daemon process to monitor your container to know its exit code so it can re report it back to Kubernetes or whoever your high level tool is. And then uh, Kubernetes has very specific requirements on what the log format should be. It's a CRI log format, so Conmon is responsible for writing out that log file. It's also responsible for uh, handling like TTY, similar to Docker attach. Uh, and finally, uh, it, it's responsible for detecting and reporting like out of memory conditions. So when your container is out of memory and it exceeds the C group limits, then Conmon is responsible for sending you a notification. So this is what a pod looks like when the runtime is run C. So you see uh, a Kubernetes pod, which is the holder of the namespaces, the IPC net, and recently the PID namespace. And it also has the high level C groups under which all the containers for the pod uh, are, uh, are scoped under. So we have the infra container, which is similar to the Kubernetes pod infra container in cryo as well and then whatever is defined in your pod spec. So we have, you can have multiple containers and each one of these are run using run C. And then as we talked about earlier, like each one of them has Conmon on top. Now you might think that why run, I mean, is Conmon heavy? No. The reason is we wrote it in C. So we use shared libraries and it is a very small, efficient daemon. So the memory usage is much lesser compared to what you would see in other projects. Uh, so we also worked with Intel, like Intel added support for clear containers, which has now become Kata. And when, when you send PRs to Cryo, we, they also run Kata container tests to make sure that we are not regressing on Kata containers. So when uh, the pod, when we are using Kata containers, Intel, uh, Intel's code actually goes and spawns a virtual machine for a pod, and then in, inside that VM, for each container, they're using lib container from run C to spawn the actual containers. So if you would want like more security, you don't trust the security of containers, and you, uh, then you would want to use Kata containers. And Cryo has support for something called as trusted and untrusted workloads. So you can s set a different trusted workload runtime and untrusted wor workload runtime. So if you want to use like VMs as containers, you would set your untrusted workload runtime to Kata, for example. So this is the overall architecture uh, of a node when using Cryo. So on the left, you see the kubelet. It's talking gRPC, CRI API. And, and on the right, we have Cryo implementing the gRPC API. So it has two different, like CRI defines two different services. One is the image service which is for like basically pulling images onto the node to make sure that whenever pod specifies some image, it, it, that image is available locally. And for that, we use our containers image library. And the other part is a runtime service, and there we use the generate library, CNI for networking, and the storage library for creating the root file system. So we support overlay, device mapper, and a bunch of other backends. And uh, finally, of course, we use uh, RunC, Kata, or any other new runtime. Like, like the advantage of the architecture that Cryo went with is it's using OCI runtimes. So any new OCI runtime that comes out can plug in and work with Cryo. Like for example, like Google announced GVisor project like a few days ago, and they have integrated it with Cryo. And the reason is because Cryo talks OCI. It's not tied to any particular runtime. Uh, and the top, you see the pods, uh, similar to what, what we saw in the earlier slides. What is the status of the project? We have a bunch of tests, as Dan mentioned earlier. No PRs merged without passing all the tests. Uh, we released, we did our first 1.0 last year. Uh, it's supported with Cube 1.7. Then uh, we did a 1.8 release. All of this like, was either on the day that Cube came out or like within a couple of days. So we track Kubernetes upstream very closely. 
the, the latest release on the 1.9 stream is the 1.9.12 that we just released yesterday. And 1.9 is actually also fully supported in OpenShift 3.9. So we have our customers using it in production and giving us feedback. And uh, finally, 1.10.1 is the latest 1.10 release, and we are tr our master is tracking 1.11. So whenever Cube 1.11 comes out, Cryo will be ready. And uh, one more goal for OpenShift 3.10 is to like fully support Cryo by default instead of the other daemon. So uh, what about the community? Like at last I checked, we had like 78 contributors from like va various companies, like uh, from Red Hat, Intel, Lyft, Suzy, and many other companies. And uh, we see more and more users coming and trying it out and reporting issues and giving us feedback on the features they need. So um, one, of the, one of the big goals with the crowd, we have OpenShift Online and OpenShift, uh, so we want to basically replace um, how do I even say it? Docker with uh, Cryo by default. And what we're doing is we're eating our own dog food. So we're actually going to run, we're running now uh, Cryo for our OpenShift Online presence. And we're slowly rolling that out to hundreds of thousands of users will be running on top of Cryo. So Cryo. Um, provides basically the interface that Kubernetes needs, but if we go back, oh, so we actually got one of, one of the people that's been using Cryo, I'm not gonna mention the name of the company, uh, we found out that they were using it and we said, why don't you say anything about it? And they gave us this quote, they didn't allow us to tell you who they are, but they had this great quote, they say, Cryo just works for them, so there's not much to say. So people, when they talk about products, it's usually about things that break on them. So this was a great quote. It's like, it just works. I don't have to say anything about it. Um, but the really goal of the cryo is to make running containers in production boring. All right? the, the whole idea, we want to make it boring. Right? Well, all we want to do is whatever Kubernetes wants, we'll do. We're not doing anything else. We're not helping any other project. We're not it's just for Kubernetes. So as I said, I work for OpenShift, and I said OpenShift's more than just Kubernetes, it has these other features. So one of the things Kubernetes, I mean OpenShift needs to do is it needs to build, be able to build these container images. It needs the ability to push con container images to container registries after a builder, right? Remember, it's got this whole um, source to image type functionality and, and different uh, things. So this is Nalan Daibai, another guy works for me, who works well on, I shouldn't say works for me, he works on my team, I'm not a manager, I'm a, a team lead. Uh, so last year, at uh, there's this big, huge conference in Brno every year, Brno Czech Republic, called DevConf. And at DevConf, we were talking about all this containers. He was the guy in charge of container storage. And I, I kept on saying to him, you know, we need, we need this ability to build containers. Uh, and I need the ability to, just like from, I said, I, I would call the core utils containers. And what I wanted to do is be able to build containers from Bash, all right, just to build, you know, simple, I, I create a, a root FS, I tar it up, and I create the JSON, okay? And, 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 I, and I said, well, what do you want to call it? I said, I don't care what you call it, just call it builder. And all of a sudden, he invented this. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna get back to it in a minute. So uh, obviously, he doesn't understand the proper way to speak English is to drop your, turn your ERs into AHs. Um, so I don't know where he came up with this name, but anyways, uh, builder. Uh, I, I leave this slide up because the, 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 the fabulous artist, Maureen Duffy, that does the coloring book for me, drew this first uh, version of, this is a Boston Terrier, by the way. And he, he has a hat on. But as soon as this went out on the internet, Twitter, the first thing we hear, heard back from everybody on Twitter is that, why do you have a picture of a dog with a, a tidy whities on its head or underwear on its head? So if you look at the uh, coloring book now, it's much more understandable as a hot hat. But uh, so. So he said he introduced the Builder project. And uh, this is the representation in the coloring book of what Builder looks like. And I think there's a resemblance between the two. Huh? So that's my get back for making fun of you. So Builder, uh, so it's core utilities for building container images. Okay, we wanted a simple interface. Um, so I wanted to basically say Builder from. So I basically say Builder from Fedora. It goes out using containers image, pulls the OCI image for Fedora off of a registry, pulls it to the lo local system, installs it on top of container storage, and creates a, what's a builder container. Creates a container that you can then use, and then I want to mount the container. So I'm gonna create a mount point on the system, so I do build, build a mount container. 
Okay, now we're going to take a quick segue. Anybody familiar with this? This tool? Okay, it, what is it? Gonna make you give me a quarter. Docker copy. Okay, guess what it does? It copies stuff into a container image. Okay, and then you can copy stuff out of a container image using this tool. I said, that is cool. So I said, I'm gonna build tools like that. So I went off and I built this tool called Copy. And I put it into Core Utilities. Okay, and what I can do with Copy is I can actually copy stuff into containers. Okay, and I can copy stuff out of containers using that syntax. It's really cool. It's on all your operating systems now. I could really get it out distributed quick. I didn't stop there. I said, you know what? I'm gonna create a tool called DNF. Sometimes it's called yum, sometimes it's called DNF. And you can use my tool, DNF, to install directly into a container image. Okay, so you can do DNF install. And for those in RHEL, that's called yum. So you can do a yum install, another tool I built. Okay, but I didn't stop there. I said, I'm gonna create a tool called make. Okay, and I built this tool called make, and I have, I added this thing called dester, so I can do a make install dester equals dollar mount. So you can actually take source code off your host, build it, make install it into the, into the container image. Really cool, huh? And then you want to create that JSON content. So we have a build a config here. So I can do a build a config entry point um, and specify the entry point environment. So all those fields that are uh, in, a, in an image, you can specify it by build a config. Once I'm done with that, once I'm happy with the way everything looks, I can commit it. I can create a container image. So I can take a uh, build a container, commit the container to a container image name, and then I want to push it to a registry. Okay, so I'm able to take that container image and I can push it in any container registry. And then you can use your favorite tool to be able to run my container. So you can run this container using the D word. Go ahead, it's a standard OCI image format, right? We can do all this stuff with it. Anytime you see red words, everybody simultaneously has to say the words. Okay, I need a lot of quarters. That's actually not saying the D word, right? That's a, a different thing. So Builder also supports a Docker file. So you can use Builder, build using Docker file, dash F Docker file, and it works. But that's too many characters for us to type. So we actually have Builder Bud. Okay, and Anheuser Busch doesn't have anything to do with this. So. so you can actually fully support using the Docker file to build containers on the host. And guess what? Look at the corner. No big fat demons, okay? What is, to me, the saddest part of, of the container revolution is all these years later, I usually ask before I start this part, is how do you build containers? And the only response I ever really get from people, unless they're trying to be smart asses, is debuild, okay? Or they will say something like source to image, which guess what, source to image is using debuild in the background. All right, so five years in, the only way to create these tabballs is this, but we've been developed a brand new tool called Builder, and it's getting a lot of return. The nice thing here is you can run these things inside of containers. I can distribute in a Kubernetes swarm, there we go, oops, wrong term, uh, 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 Kubernetes, you know, cloud, hundreds of builders going off and building these container images and pushing them to registry, really cool. Uh, this, this is pathetic, okay, on three. One, two, three. No, I invented a brand new one. I didn't call it that. What I decided to do is I was going to call it, I, I, I built this thing called Dash. <laughs> Pretty good, okay? So you can use Bash to build these things. Shell scripting, amazing. Amazing development that I developed in the 1960s. <laughs> okay? We want to allow other tools to build these fancier, higher level languages to to build container images, right? As a matter of fact, someone came up to me the other day and said, could I use Kickstart to build one of these? And I said, maybe, and they wanted to potentially look at how we could get Kickstart to work with, with Builder. But other ones are like, OpenShift uses source to image. Source to image is really cool. It's basically, you know, most developers shouldn't be worrying about creating Docker files and, and container images. They should be working on 
their web interfaces or their applications or cell phone to tools, and they basically do git check-in, git push, and boom, the tooling in the background should create the images, and that's what source to image does. Uh, but source to image right now is based on top of the D command, and so we basically we want to get Builder and swap that out and basically use Builder for it. Ansible containers. It would be really nice to use Ansible playbooks to build your container images. So Ansible containers, based on the D word. So they're working on getting Builder and replacing it the D word. So you don't have to, you know, the problem I see is everywhere you go, it's, you know, people constantly say, oh, can I turn SC Linux off because I got to take the, you know, the Docker socket, stick it in a container so I can build a container image to build a tab all. And it's like, mm, probably not a great idea. So what else does OpenShift need? It needs the ability to diagnose program problems on the host. If you guys are running Kubernetes right now, what tool do you use to figure out what images are running or what processes are running on it? What, what tool do you use? Well, you use PS, but you can say it. You guys don't have to put a quarter in, right? Use the CLI, the DCLI. Well, I don't want the DCLI in it, so if you use it to run containers, how does an admin diagnose it? He has to use that, the Docker CLI. So we decided we're going to build a new tool to be able to do it. We call it Podman. By the way, pods are, uh, uh, pods are a group of sales, so you can see the logo there. It's a group of sales in the pod. So we, we decided to introduce Podman as part of the libpod effort. So the, the libpod is the, is the GitHub um, repository for this. Uh, so we're introducing Podman as part of the, the effort. By the way, Builder is now supported fully. Actually, Builder went 1.0 today. All right, so Builder 1.0, you can actually get a uh, builder is fully supported in RHEL as of uh, RHEL 7.5.1, um, and 1.0 will be out in 7.5.2. We kind of missed the deadline for it. Um, Podman will be actually will be released into RHEL in 7.5.2 is the goal, but Podman will still be under uh, tech preview. So Podman is a tool for managing pods and containers based on the DCLI command to list the containers on the host. Podman PSA, Podman run to run a container, Podman exec, Podman images. These anything look like familiar here? So basically, we took the entire CLI and re-implemented it in Podman. Podman is a no big fat demons. There's no daemon. We don't have to have a register. If you want to run one container on a host and put it in a systemd unit file so it starts at boot time. Use Podman. You don't have to set up a different daemon that has to be running in order for a client to get into it. So basically, in a Podman world, the container is a child of the process. And guess what? Builder, Podman, Cryo are all sharing the same database. They're all sharing the same system. And guess how I did that? Anybody? I invented this thing called file systems. And you can have processes sharing the same files at the same time. Okay, so file systems. Basically, using container storage, we can have all these different tools interacting with the storage at the same time. One of the goals with Podman is that we put it under the libpod effort. So the libpod effort is basically a, uh, is a way to experiment with new ways of creating pods. Podman is our first implementation of a tool, but we want other people that potentially want to create pods, other tools that might want to create pods and interact with pods can potentially use Podman as a library for doing that. We want to get Podman eventually into Cryo. Podman does, I mean, Cryo and LibPod don't work together yet, except I mean, they work at the storage level, but we want eventually to have LibPod replace the way Cryo is doing stuff. So I talked at the beginning of the thing about this thing called Scopio. Scopio is the granddaddy of all these projects. Scopio has been around for probably three or four years now. Um, and Scopio can basically, the, the real cool thing about Scopio is that it's able to move container images between different types of container storage. You can take a one container registry and copy a container image off of that onto another container registry. I like to think of it as like RCP or SCP. So you can move containers around. You can actually take containers off of a container registry, put it into container storage. You can take a container off of a container registry and copy it directly into the Docker daemon. You can actually create files on the disk that are containers. You can, and, and, but the really cool thing is moving containers around from one container registry to another without ever having to come into the host. So the way you would do that now is you'd have to do dpull and dpush. So you'd be copying the image here and then you're pushing it here, right? We basically have implemented all of that protocol inside of Scopio. So you can do a Scopio inspect 
of a, you know, that basically pulled down just the JSON, but we have all these other ways of doing Scopio. So Scopio Coffee, um, and this tool is being used all over the place for different container registries and people are playing with it um, in all sorts of ways. And it's based, it's really just a CLI on top of containers in it. So most of the tools, Podman, Builder, all have the capabilities of doing all this stuff. So you can actually go, when, you, when I show you the Builder push to container registry, you can push directly into the Docker daemon. All right, it's all built into the tool. But all these tools are separate, right? All these tools can develop. There's people contributing at different levels all over the place. So we have people contributing at the container's image, and that's benefiting Cryo. You don't have to get the pull request into Cryo. We don't have this, this sense when I come up and say, I want to add this really cool feature to be able to store images in a foobar database. And Cryo comes along, oh, we're not interested in the foobar database, but container image might be. So if I get it in a container image, you might eventually be able to get cryo to work with the FUBAR database. So that's the idea. It's basically setting up different building blocks to be able to build different tools and basically to experiment on new ways of doing containers and containers and environments. So Container Coloring Book talks all about this. And at this point, we're into questions. So 